Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you, uh, you all had a little coffee this morning and uh, you're a little bit ready to go and you're a little awake. Uh, so you're ready to listen and learn. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end. If you have any questions, we can jump in. Uh, so my name is Ben Fisher. I work at Red Hat, um, principal product marketing manager, and part of the NRX team. And we can go talk a little bit more at, at the end about some other things. Um, so first off, I'm going to talk about basically the problem. So there's, I mean, data has lots of problems, right? Uh, but one of the problems is organizations have data, lots of data. Uh, it's the crown jewels a lot of times, um, but there's a lack of maintaining the confidentiality and integrity in at least some of their data, right? Some people don't care about some of the data, it's kind of generic, some of it's very, very, uh, very, very impersonal, very, very important, very valuable to the organization. Um, and there's, there's lots of use cases all over the map, right? Um, there's lots of industries, types of various types of companies, there's regulations that all force different reactions to data and algorithms and various and in the applications that get that use all that data and those algorithms. Um, today, from an infrastructure perspective, we generally have, in terms of kind of compute workloads, most people have kind of left the full dedicated application stack and they're going to either virtualizing everything or containerizing. Uh, everything in the stack, you know, and especially when they're, they're moving it off to the cloud and off-premises, um, unless it's a SaaS model, which is basically the same thing. Uh, these are kind of the two different uh, paradigms that we have in terms of stacks. Um, pretty much the same thing um, with the, you know, little bit of difference in how you treat elements in the stack. Uh, for XKCD fans, um, here's kind of the security <laughs> the, the sarcastic security perspective of the stack and how everyone kind of gets blamed, right? There's just all these different places in the stack that can be compromised. Uh, you can look at it a little bit later, but you know, basically everything in the stack is looked at as being compromised. And so there's lots of weak spots everywhere, right? It's like a, it's like a big sieve. There's just lots of holes and there's lots of opportunities for threats. And you know, the simple thing, if you think about threat actors, right? they are always going to go after where the, the easiest spot is. So, um, and it also depends on that particular person, whatever they have access to. So this is kind of what it's talking about, you know, whether they're a Bitcoin miner or an employee or whatever, whatever they have access to, that's what they're going to uh, compromise the easiest that they can. So we kind of understanding where the problem is, you know, you're kind of stuck in a little bit of a quandary, right? You have the stack, you can't really do anything to CPU, because there's only a few CPU manufacturers that are out there. The applications, hopefully, as an organization, that's kind of what you develop, so hopefully trust yourself in doing the development. Hopefully you follow best practices in CI, CD, you know, static, you know, dynamic code analysis, et cetera. Um, but the stuff in the middle, we can abstract. And if you can abstract that and try to tr reduce the, the, the threat vectors that you have and you reduce the amount of things that you have to trust in a stack, um, there's a lot of power in that. There's a lot of safety. So if you can think about not trusting the host, not trusting the owner, the operator, and you can cryptographically verify hardware and software, and you audit all the software, you can dramatically reduce what you need to trust and what you need to can be concerned about. Basically, you're reducing the, the areas that you could be attacked by or your threat vectors. So if you can do this, this would be a very well-suited application for a lot of things, but uh, specifically microservices, any like really sensitive data, like we, uh, you know, regulations like any PII, uh, you know, financial data records, whatnot, but also the algorithms you might utilize to go and uh, analyze that data. Um, if you can get simple deployment, that helps a lot. Easy development integration, and if you can be standards-based, um, you're actually making a huge progress, not just not trusting certain things, but also getting some benefits out of it. And, and this, this kind of comes to an issue where today we have encryption for data at rest. We have lots of solutions. The industry is very good, right? You have laptops, at least maybe not academic laptops, but at least your corporate enterprise laptops. Uh, you know, regardless of the operating system, it's very standard that those those disks are encrypted. If you have databases in your enterprise organization, most likely at least the important data there is, is should be encrypted. A lot of things are encrypted. As far as data in transit or data motion, um, 
Again, lots of options. You probably all have VPNs or have had that experience. You've seen TLS search to websites, right? This is all ways that while your data is being, you know, moving, moving through various networks that you are not aware of and you don't trust, you can have a layer of trust that when you send your credit card information along or, or whatever that confidential, you know, critical information for you, that it's, there's a reasonable amount of confidential and security in doing that. The problem, though, is while you have it at rest and you have it in motion, when it's being used, there's, there's really no security paradigm to, to really make sure that that's uh, both secure uh, and the data integrity is, is, is uh, maintained as well. It's just, it, there's a risk there, right? There's lots of things in the stack. There's a lot of different types of potential um, threat paths to, integrate, uh, to attacking or getting access to various points in, in that stack. So that brings us to uh, trusted execution environments, or called TEs. Who's, raise of hands, who's ever heard of a TEE? That's great. Okay, before the session? Okay, who, keep your hands up. Who actually feels confident and roughly understanding what a TEE is? So, yeah, a little less. All right, that's good. So, hopefully this is, this is a little bit more of you. So, we're just going to go through quickly what our TEE is in a sense, or at least our perspective. Um, so, we kind of think of it as kind of the application of middleware, basically supporting the application as, as what that trusted execution environment is. Uh, whereby only the CPU really has access to that, that TEE. And we're just, everything else there doesn't have access to the TEE because uh, the CPU is going to block it. Um, the other way to think of it is it's, it's kind of a protected area in, this, in the CPU. Really what we're doing is kind of, a, it's encrypted memory pages, right, um, that the CPU is util, utilizing uh, to execute various workloads, whatever, executing the data. Whoops, backwards, there you go. Um, so now I'm going to talk about NRCs, and we can talk a little bit more, uh, some extra details about it. Um, but it's it's a, one of the TEs that is out there uh, in the universe. And um, in terms of our design principles, or our, our, actually our main principles, is we don't want to trust the owner, we don't want to trust the users, the hardware, or the software. But the exception on the hardware is we we have to trust the CPU at a certain level. Uh, although we do that with kind of a whitelist blacklist. So that if you ever change your mind on which CPUs or which vendors of CPUs or versions of CPUs that you can change with the times. Because there is a potential that you trust the CPU one day and the next day maybe you find out about a vulnerability on a particular manufacturer or a particular line from a particular manufacturer and you might want to block that, right? So we, we understand that it's not like we're going to trust any and every CPU, period. And from a design principles, I'd expect that most of you probably are familiar uh, or could guess most of the stuff, right? We want to have uh, minimize, minimize what we trust. So minimal con trusted computing base. We want to minimize all the various trust relationships and that we have to establish. Um, we, want, we want deployment portability. We want CPU portability. We don't want to be stuck on any particular CPU, CPU vendor, uh, version of a CPU. Um, we want to have that full portability. It's kind of you know, Red Hat's perspective on um, you know, put your workload wherever you want, and then if you change your mind on where it is, you want to move to a different CPU, another vendor, another cloud, that's, that's completely within your power. So we want to empower them to do that. Um, the network stack is outside of the trusted compute base, so that's, that's kind of important. We're trying to keep also the, the imprint or the size of the keep as small as possible. Not really quite here. No backdoors, memory safety. Um, part of that's actually being coding in Rust as a primary language to provide a lot of those benefits. Open source, we're following open standards, um, like uh, WebAssembly in WASI. Uh, full auditability, um, and of course, we've talked about the security at rest in transit and now in use. So in, in terms of the architecture, um, it's. I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of this particular graphic, but uh, what we're really talking about is we, we have kind of up the, up, uh, way up there, right? Uh, we have kind of the NRX piece kind of up in the application space where you have the application that's running NRX and you have the bindings down to the WebAssembly layers. And then you have the various uh, CPU stacks that it can ride on. Um, one interesting kind of note is actually, uh-oh. In terms of NRX, there's we support both process and virtual based um, 
attempts at CPUs providing uh, keeps or um, TEEs. Um, so you have SGX, which is like Intel, that's, that's the big one. And the other big one up there on the other side is the SCV, which is uh, AMD's approach. Uh, ARM also has, by the way, their own thing, but they call it a trust zone, but it's not, we don't consider it a fully, a full TEE. It's kind of aspiring to be a TEE and it's providing some of the benefits, but it's not necessarily, we feel, it's not meeting the bar of all the things that you really should have in a TEE to establish. So we're not there yet, they're still developing a future iteration of chipsets, hopefully, uh, and they'll, they'll hopefully get there in the future. Um, so, but you have the chipsets, you have kind of your WebAssembly support and, and you support and you have your application kind of running on top. So one thing to think about is an ARC's not as a, a development, but more of a deployment framework, right? So, you know, you're going to choose your own language or whatever you want to put your application on. You're going to develop it and all we need is, we support WebAssembly, so you need to compile it into WebAssembly. You choose the host and instant configuration. And so we call it a deployment framework because uh, your host and instance, you'd put on something like OpenShift and, uh, you know, develop an application and compile a WebAssembly. Well, we really don't care about that. Uh, you can use whatever dev tooling you feel like, right? Um, and then because it's on something like OpenShift or whatever, you're, you're, running, you're running it and you have the ability to have it fully portable and put it on whatever cloud or internally or wherever you want, right? We're not necessarily restricting you by one CPU vendor or, or one cloud vendor or anything like that. So let's get a little into kind of how this works. So from, from the component standpoint, uh, we have the host and, and the client parts. Uh, on the host, we have the, the keep and the agent. And of course, we have, we don't care about most of the hardware, but we do care definitely about uh, the CPU, right? Uh, and on the client side, uh, we obviously have the client, CLI if we're using that, and uh, the orchestrator. So in terms of uh, the attestation process, you'd start with uh, the CLI or the orchestrator uh, contacting the agent to say, hey, let's set up a workload. Uh, then the agent would request from the CPU, hey, I want to set up a keep. Uh, then the CPU would actually create that keep and load the NRX runtime. Um, then with that empty keep loaded, right, it, we would do a measurement of the keep, we do some attestation um, of NRX uh, in the runtime, and we'd verify that basically it's running, it's set up, it's okay, it's what we expected, it's basically empty, there's no malware, unexpected other things that are loaded in there, and if we, if we verify that, then, that was, then we'd go ahead and then we'd send the code and data, algorithms, whatever, in encrypted format and execute the workload. And it said go to the CPU and the CPU would send it along to the key. So this is an early demo, but uh, we'll get to a demo, two more slides. So basically we have this, we're in the demo, we're gonna have a server, we're gonna have a client, and what you're gonna see is an attestation handshake, and you're gonna see the code and data uh, encrypted being delivered and executed in the key. So let's see. All right, I'm gonna resize that. It got really fuzzy. So let's try to, uh, let's, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, and why is this not working? It doesn't need to be online, so it's be, all right, I, all right, this is great. Of course, I ever do a demo and it's recorded and it breaks. So let me tell you what you would have seen. <laughs> and next time I have to do screenshots. So it's a very simple algorithm. All we're doing is we're, there's an algorithm. Uh, we're just taking and saying, take three, take four, add them together, send it to the keep, okay? And you'll see, you basically see a series of like, I think it's actually seven lines. Um, 
like kind of a process before, and you basically see, okay, send it up the keep, you see uh, the attestation that the keep's been created. You see the keep's been created. You see that the, it's been verified okay that the keep was empty, right? Uh, then you actually see uh, an encrypted string of data. And then you see, um, you see that it, it ends and closes, and then you, you basically get you know, the number seven, right? Um, and then we run it a second time. And the reason why we want to send it, the reason why we run it the second time is not only do you want to verify that, hey, this is reproducible to some extent, but um, the, the encrypted data that we send is a, is a different string. And so that's important to understand because that, that shows that we're having, we're having perfect forward secrecy. So it's not like you can just take the key and go, oh, look, you know, we changed it from three to four to three to five, and all of a sudden, you know, five of the digits are the same, and then there's a way to kind of hack through the data. So um, that's, that's what we're trying to show. So anyways, I, I apologize for that. I will have to find a way to, to make that more resilient. So um, yeah, and so here's the slides of um, talking about what we, what we should have seen, but we didn't see. All right, let me just, I'm just gonna, ah, oh, yeah, it didn't work, all right. All right, so just kind of reviewing uh, in terms of design principles, this is all stuff we reviewed before, uh, but this is just, this is really important that we do this and we do this right. Uh, and it's, you know, part of the part, uh, part of the things that's really important is that we do it in an open standard way that's very portable. It's just, we, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, there's a lot of organizations that are out there um, that are not necessarily, don't have the, as much of a history of being open. And so um, we really want to make sure that everything is as open as possible and we get as much contribution from the community to make sure that everything is not just kind of beaten up from a security standpoint, but that it will meet the needs of, of the world, right? Of whatever needs that are out there. Um, I think I ended fast. No way, okay. Um, <laughs> I kind of, I was hoping the demo would have worked. Uh, so I apologize. I'm ending early, I'm sorry. So um, basically, we need your help. There's a lot of great things out there. We have a website. Uh, there's a code depot. There's a Gitter depot. Um, you can see master plan. You can see a bunch of great stuff. Um, and I'd love to hear any questions you might have. Dimitri. Can you get back to the flow of the deployment? Yeah, it was right before the demo. Yes, this one. This one? All right. Yes. Yes. There is no communication through there. We're trying to show that there there is an agent, but the data is it's it's um, it's it's processing. If I remember right, I think it's just processing through there, but it's not it's not actually reading or doing anything with the data. How is agent getting there? Oh, how is it getting loaded? Ooh. Um, I thought that he's a part of the workflow. I thought that you do the attestation to the CPU. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, the CPUs have a very widely varied implementations. I mean, and it's more than just the fact that it's processed and uh, 
uh, and virtual based. Uh, we're trying to abstract as much of that as possible. Uh, it's kind of a, a kind of an ongoing challenge, I guess you'd probably say. Um, and like one of the issues with like SGX is it has they have their own instruction set. So it's and it is. I'm probably not going to say this accurately, but they have a huge amount of instruction set that you have to kind of load, and it's like you just can't just run right on the CPU. So it's got it's got a lot of issues that are not well met today, and some people don't. It's it has a lot of overhead and uh, some development challenges with with the way it's it's being um, Intel supporting it. Yes. It sounds like it is something that's a part of an RC project that is deployed, which is not actually the case. It is a part of the vendor provided software that is a branch of the Yeah. So yeah. you don't like download something from an RC a portion of an RC Correct. project. You interface with whatever vendor provides. So it would be clear if you have something like vendor provided Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think we need to clarify the slides, so we'll just take note of that. I think the key question is, do yep. you trust it or not, the Renard agent? If you don't trust it, the question is how it gets there is just a regular one, right? Yeah. It's just outside of the trusted zone. Some software being installed somehow comes from your vendor or anyone, right? You don't trust it. You don't need well, to. It is a part of the CPU. It, it comes with the CPU. You, you cannot test test the chip, yeah. Yeah, that's why it should like belong to the VMware box and give more like. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite understand. Can you repeat that? Everyone has an Intel chip, so how do I assess that I'm talking to the right one? That the one called is not running in an Intel is not plugging as well. It it will talk to the chip and it's 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 talking directly down the hardware stack on whatever silicon it's on, right? It's not virtualized to do networking across The networking is outside of the, the trusted compute stack, trusted compute base. You cannot tell it's not virtualized unless you uh, like have uh, some, some private key in the CPU and distribute it of the keys all over the place. And then you have to have a good, a huge database of, of the keys of CPUs that are trusted currently. And, uh, I guess that's, that's an explanation for the first group. Well, I mean, I know I, and I'm not a developer, so I, I apologize right there because it's going deep. But the, there is a way for us to attest to uh, the particular silicon through the silicon that it's on to the CPU that's on that silicon. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Yeah, and I, I can virtualize the whole attestation process, and how we, how we can find out only through private keys. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, and they have an employee who, you know, whatever, hacks a bunch of machines or, you know, starts, you know, has physical access and, and puts probes on the hardware or whatnot, uh, or whether you're running in China or, you know, down the street or in Russia, that it doesn't matter if there's a physical compromise on the machine or anything like that because everything that would be used would be encrypted and it would be verified that it would be, it'd be empty and secure prior to anything being loaded. And then it would be unloaded and the keep would be dismantled once that process, once the application had, had finished its execution. I don't have the answer for exactly for what you're saying is how do you know? I know there's ways that they're doing that and that it is a, uh, it, it's being developed, right? It's not final. Yes. Yeah, care. we don't care. It's a CPU and test and it's a valid CPU. But you have outside of the actual runtime a chain of trust where you basically want to send a work list of files of trust. The sure. only thing is that it's a different side of the trust. You're just connecting to, I don't know, AWS or Google. And so you verify the certificate that, yes, this is being run by this corporation that I, that I kind of trust to actually send and deploy a work list. Yeah. There is, and there's there's a there's what we'd kind of call like a, a whitelist blacklist, so that we're we're talking about trusting trusting the CPU. Um, the benefit would of that would be as you're you know as you're running workloads and you're you're, you're operating you know your various NARCs keeps. If you ever lost faith in either a CPU vendor or a particular series of CPUs you'd just be able to say, I don't trust them. And whether it's permanent or temporary because there's a lot of confusion and you haven't established what you want, you could just you know, knock off a particular vendor and then it would never run. So even if you're running in a cloud, the only thing you'd want to do is just make sure that that cloud has other CPU options and that you're willing to pay for, right? Um, or you'd have to then move those workloads to a, a cloud vendor that, that offered those types of CPUs. So, yes? Yes. Um, to be able to run the application inside NRCs, you need to recompile the application. You do have to recompile. Uh, it, it supports WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we believe that WebAssembly is kind of like JavaScript done right. Um, it's kind of, kind of part of the theme. And uh, one of our lead developers is actually on the WebAssembly uh, standards boards. And so we're helping to not only shape that, but we also have kind of understanding of, of where WebAssembly is going. Uh, so I think it's like, there's a way over 30, 30, 40 languages that now can be recompiled into WebAssembly, even like Fortran and just old languages. Uh, so there's a lot of support out there. So yes, it is a step, but once you get into WebAssembly, um, it, it's really easy to support. Yes? I don't understand a lot of things. No, anything's great. Uh, yeah, these, these TEs, yes. Intel's had it out for a while um, in a variety of different CPUs, and uh, AMD also has some. I think uh, theirs is newer. I can't remember exactly when their, their SCV came out. What's their instruction set? What do they? They, they have their own uh, specs on what their instruction sets are. Uh, Intel's is called SGV, and, and uh, AMD's is called S, S SCV. S SGX. Did I not say SGX? Yeah. You said SGV. Like oh, sorry. I'm mixing the two. I'm like slurring my speech. Okay. SGX is the Intel, and SCV is the AMD one. Um, and you said dynamically manage many of those, but you use and they just schedule and all the right. Yes. Yeah, so there's, there, there's no reason why you can't have multiple NRCs keeps on the same CPU. So, so long as there's enough you know, memory resources to, to handle that. And you can, like here, you have the orchestrator, so you can you could orchestrate that out if you wanted as well. I 
believe so. I mean, the, the orchestration of, of this is, is not, you know, I think that's cunning. We're trying to get more of the CPU, get, the, get, get it running in a full, full way uh, on multiple CPUs and keep aware of other CPU manufacturers that might start offering enough capability so we can kind of, you know, go laterally. And orchestration, I think, is something that once we kind of have this out and running, orchestration is going to we'll develop more and further on the feature set of orchestration. It's... Yeah. Extra CPU channel, so it works just like a process. It just happens to execute inside this physically separate block of memory where it's encrypted. Is it have separate threading or something to do with it? Threading would be a question of whether or not WebAssembly supports that. But yeah, basically. You, know, okay, so you can have yeah. multiple processes, but like SGX has 96 meg of memory reserved for it, so I would run. You wouldn't set the keep up as a a like a container, if you will, as an analogy, just to start running multiple different workloads and just kind of making it this big bloated thing. You, it's it's meant a little bit more for microservices where you'd execute on some data and algorithm an application. Once it's finished that, then it would close itself down. And if you needed to do something else, or you needed to let's say run a calculation twice to verify that the calculation was correct, then that would be the reason to start a second key. Oh, good. <laughs> so now you're saying, OK, concurrency isn't a solved problem, but with the source code for that. And so I should, should I expect you to come next year and say, OK, we, we have solved concurrency, we have threads inside this thing. Then, OK, we have added more RAM there. Then, OK, we have plumped network stack there. And uh, we have allowed some uh, new form of uh, DMA, for example, or whatever. Should I expect this thing to? The software? No. If you chose to compile a ginormous application into WebAssembly, it's not on us, right? That's your choice, right? Um, we are explicitly trying to keep it very small. Um, that's one reason why we just decided to not include the network stack. Um, Uh, we care about performance, but performance is not the first and foremost consideration. Uh, as as a, you know, we're, we care about the confidential integrity of the data first and foremost. Uh, at when we, as we are developing the project further, we will care about performance because if the performance is, you know, let's say if there's a 10% performance hit, I think some people would be fine with that. But if it's a 3,000% performance hit because it's not scaling, then that would be unreasonable and not, nobody would adopt it, right? So performance is important, but if we don't have the data confidentiality and integrity piece solved and have the confidence in, in users to, to actually utilize NARCs for that reason, then it doesn't make a difference. And some stuff is so critical, people will pay an extraordinary performance hit if, if it's that critical, right? So, we need to solve the primary use case, and we need to then work on it. Part of, part of what we're trying to do is keep, keep an ARC software code very, very small, very compact. So we have uh, some kernel experts. We're always looking for more uh, to, to do basically a super micro kernel. We're actually using virtualization approach, but we're basically, it's going to be, it's, it's going to act it's like virtualization, but not like the way you're accustomed to running virtual workloads, which is a massive virtualization load that takes, you know, minutes to basically load on a machine, we're talking about something that's a little bit more like a container feel, where basically it's, it's instantaneous when you, when you execute it. So even though we talked about right this, this is something, and I, I can't show the demo, but uh, the demo was, was, it was just instant, and the idea is that even when it's fully, it's fully developed, that it would still basically be instantaneous in terms of you getting that, that workload up and running. And then the performance, the hard part is, okay, how long would it take to run WebAssembly? And whatever you compile into WebAssembly, your application, that's a little bit harder. Uh, but then that's, that's where the crypto uh, computation piece is going to 
is going to have some hit because anytime you do crypto, there's always a performance hit, and uh, there's a big difference in different types of silicon potentially there. Yes. So we were talking about attestation and validation of what standard and X bits uh, been on play um, yep. previously. One of the interesting differences in the types of heaps you were presenting was that SGX is a, a strictly hardware based solution. Correct. You would roll a key and the hardware does all the validation and attestation of what you're giving it to make sure that it's it's trusted and that you're allowed to run there. Whereas SEV and MKTMP basically just RAM encryption. It's, it's page level assigned key to something and whatever goes out into RAM gets encrypted and decrypted on the way back in. Given that, you've got to do some level of, of emulation of, of that attestation phase. So is there an implicit trust in, in eARCs when you just run enclaves into something that is a hardware-based solution? When you say hardware-based solution, what do you mean? So, It's hardware instruction set. Yeah, there's, there's a or there's CPU instruction set. There's an SDX that says enter an enclave and that tells the CPU go and decrypt this this package of software that you've given me and load it into secure memory and, and make sure that it's trusted. Whereas SEV, any old process on the system or MKTME could say for this set of pages, assign this key that I gave you and encrypt the memory and the CPU doesn't care if it's user, right? Correct. So, That's a complicated question, but I think the answer is yes. I think you're, you're trying to ex explicitly trust in ARCs. There is some level of trust you have to have in ARCs because it is abstracting right, 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 like a lot of the hardware don't stack, trust, right? Don't trust the user, don't trust the... We are saying the trust in ARCs. CPU. We're trying to prove it too, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> Except and the demo failed. <laughs> um, although I, I will throw the curveball out of, and later I think Luke Hines is presenting on Key Lime, I think it's 2 o'clock. Um, one, one thing that's been kind of thrown out is, is does NARCs work better or does it conflict with a solution like Key Lime? So Key Lime is at a simple thing is um, it's, it's, it's running against the TPM20 chipsets and it's, it's basically doing uh, boot and uh, runtime uh, attestation. And so there is actually a good use case to run both of them together. Uh, it's not conflicting and it can work if you, but the, what the, the issue with that would be you'd have to have control of the environment or you would have to make sure that whoever is running that environment for you, the cloud provider, is running uh, Keylime or some, some solution like that uh, to provide that, that level of runtime boot attestation to add that extra layer of, of confidence and security. Uh, oh, no, you, yes, uh, up front. How did you uh, or just send the, the different keys uh, to different CPUs in, in a, at a scale? So, I mean, uh, this is okay if you run on a single host, but you have to run in a cluster. Uh, how did you uh, spread the keys and so on to be consistent that you can move uh, a workload between hosts? without uh, having to recompile or doing anything else? 
Well, the, recom the, the, the compiling is, is into WebAssembly, right? So whatever software you'd have, you're, you're compiling to WebAssembly. So one, you, you'd need to have it already in WebAssembly so that you could use. Uh, I think what we're talking about, and I'm a little bit hazy on, on what your question was, um, I don't think you would take a running NRX keep and migrate that. You would, if you wanted, if you didn't want it on a particular location, a particular stack, cloud vendor, or whatever, you would, you'd have to kill the keep and then you'd have to launch it somewhere else. Or you would say, I don't want to run any new keeps here. I'd want to have my new keeps uh, on my, my lab or you know on my private cloud or only on Google Cloud or whatever it would be. Yeah, but no, I, what I mean is just uh, in order to uh, avoid a single point of failure in that kind of uh, technologies, maybe you can you know, want to uh, run a keep in every host just to move your workload between those hosts. But how can you uh, send or do it transparently? Yeah. <laughs> so you have a workload. So uh, it might be a longer running service. It might be something that does uh, an atomic operation, like small operation that some computation is going to be involved or to prevent something, right? It's focused on the critical security operation. So you have an enclave, and you have the hardware that then the enterprise is the endpoint. And you could you could use the orchestrator to change you know whatever the rules are and how you'd want to orchestrate it or where you'd want to launch new workloads or the whitelist blacklist of if you decided all of a sudden 2 p.m. you saw a Krebs article on something and you started going oh I don't know about Intel SGX you know whatever series um, and you wanted to blacklist that then you could put that in and say I want to kill all loads and uh, relaunch them on only on you know the whitelisted uh, CPUs going forward. So you have to re-encrypt your workload. You you would have to re-substantiate. Yeah, You'd have to relaunch everything. It's a part. It's a part of the deployment hmm. of the workload every time you encrypt to that specific physical enclave that you are going to. Right? Because you're building up. But that's where the recompilation. It's just it's a lot of like you basically you wanna you wanna. You'd want to re restart the whole key, and you'd want to start it up with as much trust as possible. So, if the whitelist and blacklist had changed, you'd want to make sure that was considered on the new thing. So, if you had any issues, you'd probably want to kill the keep and then and relaunch the workload. And instead of moving something live, this this doesn't work for migration, right? You'd need to you can start new things um, on a new new platform. Thank you. Uh, uh, you and the uh, Liberty. Um, so I've been looking at this through the uh, from the perspective of not as a developer, but as like a traditional sysadmin. Okay. So am I not going to see like a traditional monolithic workload like an Oracle database running in this kind of environment, but rather only the occasional variable? 
very sensitive commands that it needs to, or operations that it needs to do? Or is this like only a microservices concept that I want to see in the Kubernetes environment? So I will answer first, and I'll let Dimitri uh, correct me, maybe. Um, Dumb this down. No, no, that's, uh, well, that's, that's the language I speak best. Um, so I think as, as far as particular use cases, we talked about uh, like some of the industries and regulations and some of that stuff. And if you really want to get detailed, then it comes down to, hey, what's the application and, and what's the size and, and all that. I think that's a little bit to be determined. What, what are the really critical things that are going to actually adopt TEEs? There's a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, potential cases. Um, it is best suited for microservices, I do agree, for things like that, because it's small, and when we talk about performance, as was said earlier, hey, microservice, something very dedicated, something that's just running as you need it and is not there, um, it's kind of idyllic, right? Um, but the reality is who knows? I mean, if, if you're talking about, I mean, and we don't really know, right? The world of security is kind of crazy. Something could happen you know, in two weeks from now, and all of a sudden people panic, and if there's something like an ARCS, they might say, oh, you know, heck with it, let's just recompile some big megalithic code and throw it in there, or run the keep, and we'll, we'll pay the, you know, the, the crazy compute, because now we're covered, right? And we don't want to have the, the exposure of this not being protected. Uh, I think it could happen, but you, I, I don't think anybody's realistically going to do that, except if they had to for like a very short period of time, because it just doesn't make it doesn't make sense to me. I don't I don't know. What are your thoughts, Dimitri? <laughs> like, hey, small amount of memory and we can encrypt it, we can do this with it. And yeah, so it's like really suitable for really small operations where you can very clearly define what your security order is. Um, but you can never run like an entire Oracle database in there because right now they've got about 100 meg of RAM that you have to do everything in, like literally physically, 100, 100 meg of RAM separate DRAM. Um, whereas MKTMB and SUV are literally just page table magic.
that might be, but we could be taken out of that. And that's the very gray area, right? Yeah. Because if the use cases that are going to be solved would be taken out. And right now, it's like, we need to pick where we're going, right? It's a platform that allows you, it's like a shot here. So I, I think the more interesting Ansible use case, if that's I understood the question, would be a certain automation step where Ansible goes and calls and says, start this keep, grab this encrypted data set called blah, pull it in, move it, move it in an encrypted fashion, run the execution, take the result, move it encrypted, deploy it encrypted, and then you access it later in some other, other process because you need it for something else. Yeah, and Ansible is often used in the CI environment, so I yes. see So, so one thing that's interesting about TEEs from a general standpoint is um, obviously there's developing or developers or organizations that are worried about how do I deal with sensitive data and how do I protect it. Um, so there's that interest in TEEs. But the other instance is um, you have cloud providers that are saying, you know, uh, how do we provide the, the confidence and assurance to our users that the data is being uncompromised. And it, it's, it's both the, the concern of how do we provide the level of trust, uh, concern to minimize any state actors, um, possibly tampering with the data, or you know, maligned uh, employees or whatnot. Um, there's also quite a bit of interest um, from, from certain regions in Asia as well. So thank you very much. If, if you want to talk further, I'm happy to talk outside. Thank you.